Would you like to know how to protect yourself and your team from the plume of aerosol coming out of your patient's mouth and nose during dental treatment? Dr. David Hearn is my guest today and he has practical answers that make sense. He's going to be talking about surface contamination, aerosolization, air purification, HEPA filtration, and more. And we're starting right now. And now, Amazon number one best-selling author, Dr. Tom, the Gems Guy, Orant. Dr. David Ahern is a full-time practicing dentist. He's held faculty positions at the University of Michigan and NYU's College of Dentistry. He was a founding member of the ADA's Ergonomics Subcommittee. He's the founder of Design Ergonomics, the nation's largest independent dental office design firm, and Ergonomic Products, a manufacturer of high productivity, ergonomically sound dental equipment. David, thank you so much for joining us here today. How are you doing? Uh, we're doing great, Tom, and it's great to uh, have a chance to, uh, to catch up at this crazy busy time. We've been really busy uh, with the thought process of what this situation we have right now changes in the way we think about how we do what we do as, as a profession, as all of us have. I appreciate the thought that you've put into this, and th this is why I asked you actually to join me. I, I know that you've been really concerned, not just now, but, but for a long time, about the way that dental offices are dealing with aerosols. Is that right? I've been bothered by this problem for heading on 30 years. When I started out in practice, you know, the HIV was at its peak in the mid 80s. Tuberculosis was a crisis in the early 90s. And we really never addressed the infectious potential of the environment that we were in. So, you know, I've been really bothered by the fact that there, there aren't any regulations on our uh, existing designs. There aren't any regulations on our offices. And because it is not a regulatory issue that I'm concerned with, it's the safety of our people. And, you know, the problem is that that in a typical dental office, the the design of the heating circulation system is, is closer to what you do for your house or an insurance office than it is for a laboratory research center. Uh, you know, each of a typical dental office is lucky to get 20% recirculation fresh air per hour, uh, which means 80% of the air is getting churned around at best in a typical dental office uh, all day, every day. And so that was uh, a big, big challenge for me. So, you know, when we looked at that, we, um, I mean, if you look at a typical dental office, there's, I've got an image of a typical dental office here. And, you know, this is a small office tends to mix it all together. So you've got aerosols coming out of people's mouths, getting mixed and blown into the waiting room and, and every other place in the office. Small offices especially have a bigger problem if they're just designed the way a typical heating system will be designed. Bigger offices start to change that some. They didn't change it because of infection control. They changed it because the climates in the treatment environment really are different than the climates in the front office environment because of the heat load from lights, for example. You know, so much more intense lights in, traditionally in, in the treatment zone. So they'd run two different systems that way. That was an improvement, but it really wasn't a solution. When you get to a, even bigger offices, you know, we tend to break into three zones. So you're going to have a level of air quality that varies in those three spaces. Problem I have is I live in that space in green on your slide where, uh, I mean, I spend 80% of my time. That's kind of unacceptable for our staffs if we're just churning that air around. And if you think about it, once you break it into three zones, what you've done is then you've concentrated the, the air that may be contaminated from aerosols in that zone. So that's, a, I mean, that's an issue that we really hadn't been talking about for all this, you know, all this time. So, so what do we know from the current pandemic? If we're looking at the worldwide situation right now, the crisis, what do we know from this pandemic that may indicate the need to change? What's changing? This is the problem. The problem that we have now is that 
We are months into a science project where we're in the Petri dish. And data is changing every day as we come along. And so we're being asked to go ahead and make ourselves safe. We're being asked to go ahead and try to stay in business when the data is not fully clear. So for me, I have to go to the earliest sites of, for feedback and the early experiments were done in Wuhan. And thankfully they accidentally did some very interesting research back then, which I think is, is quite insightful and a little bit troubling. So the CDC released a report of a restaurant in Wuhan. And the restaurant in Wuhan had, I think, 72 occupants in the restaurant. It was a multi-story restaurant, but, you know, typical urban restaurant in, in China. And so what you see is there are sections of the restaurant with different heating systems. And the heating system is marked, it, this, the tables A, B, C, D, E, F, were in one heating zone where you had an air conditioning unit on one wall circulating and taking care of that entire space. What's really important in that, in that accidental study was that one zone had one person come in early in the time of the infection, before they knew what to do, before they were really controlling how they were, were dealing with the virus, but they had already made the commitments to go ahead and isolate people when they discovered they had the virus. The person A1 on January 24th was diagnosed with COVID. They'd been in the restaurant, I forget what day before that. All of the people in the restaurant, when they recognized that day that that person had been coughing and had the symptoms, were sequestered immediately. All 72 people were locked down quarantined. Like we've never done that. So they now had a controlled study. And in the controlled study, what they found was eight people got infected and sick. And they were all from that one contiguous air conditioning zone. And you'll note that even the folks out of the immediate plume D, E, and F, no one got infected. And many people got infected within that direct circulation downstream, which we can understand, but also upstream. And so if you want a clear indicator of the aerosol nature of this illness, that's it. That's your smoking gun here, unfortunately. That's that's uh, absolutely fascinating. I'm um, I'm staring at the uh, the diagram, and it is, you say smoking gun. It literally is like a gun. In other words, it's uh, as if you took not even a shotgun, but uh, a target rifle, and just shot at those people with the virus. Unfortunately, so um, nobody downstairs got it. Nobody side stream got it. So there's bad news in this, but there's good news in this. So. One of the things that we'll get to later, I've been saying since early on, because we got this data pretty early, was that giving this program with lack of clarity, I want to apologize to anybody that's a listener, there will be imperfect data here. This is an imperfect time for information. Please don't misconstrue what I'm saying. Surfaces were not the primary problem surface of the CDC again just released two days ago a notice I've been trying my wife's a pathologist so her misfortune is that every day I come home from working on what we're working on and say what's the latest result on aerosols what's the latest result on surfaces what's the and she has to give me a download which is annoying and the annoying part is there was no surface data coming in well if you see here this isn't surface. People weren't getting it from this winding up on the surface of table D, E, or F. And so what I don't want people to misconstrue is it doesn't mean we have to, don't have to do a great job disinfecting every surface. It's possible somebody could cough on a surface and we'll get to that later. 
and, so, and somebody could pick up that and then wind up with it in their eye or whatever. There are some reports where some surgeons think they got it through their eyes. So people are getting sick. I mean, that's what we know about this. And people are getting sick as providers. Another unintended experiment in Wuhan. This is going to be published. It's approved for publication in neurosurgery. Endoscopic neurosurgeons doing transnasal surgery in Wuhan. As the pandemic was already going, they had to do cranial surgery. They're in peppers. So they're in, I mean, I don't know if you've seen, like we got folks can't even get a mask. They got all their folks in a hazmat suit and a pepper doing these surgeries. 14 people or more, at least 14, in the surgical team and in the immediate support team became infected doing these surgeries under hospital surgical control room situations in hazmat suits and pappers. That's a problem. So people are getting sick. There's no two ways about it. And that's a, it's just a, a I mean, it, we, we just can't ignore this. And if people are saying, you know, I think, well, I'm going to, all my folks are eventually going to get infected. You know, I'm in New York, 30% of my folks have already been infected. We'll only let the people come back that have already been exposed. You don't want to be the office that's contact traced back to the major out, outbreak in your town. Okay, so if it's not like, I'm kind of motivated to save my life. I'm certainly motivated to save the lives of all the people that I work with. In addition, I would really like to make sure that nobody gets infected in my office from being in my office. So we need to be aware of that because again, this is super early data. This is January, 2020 data, you know, reporting in from the surgeries in 2020. So to get that now into a study and, and approved in a journal, that's usually a kind of two year timeline. You know, so this data is coming fast and, and coming from, you know, odd sources and it's coming somewhat in, anecdotally. There aren't double blind studies. We don't have time for that now. So that's the, ch that's the challenge that we have. So we know we have to do something. We know we have to go ahead and remediate in some way. But if it's to go ahead and change the air systems in every office in America, there aren't enough heating and air conditioning technicians in the country to go ahead and and remediate all those offices and they certainly aren't going to do it in a timeline that's going to let us get back in practice that was the thing that was giving me heartburn in february it was like i knew there's a problem i knew i'd been thinking about this problem for 20 over 25 years but i didn't know how to do some of the things that i had done that we'll talk about that i did back when I didn't know how we could immediately do those and get practices back going. And besides that, we've just shut down all the offices. There's enough money to go ahead and, and do all that. So there had to be another way to do it. You say we have to do something. So like what? What do you suggest? Here's where it gets interesting for me. Back in 93, long time ago, again, I was worried. I, I'd been through you know, the AIDS epidemic. We had been through what was at that time a real concern about tuberculosis, it's many, much of it in rural communities. And so we knew that there was a potential for threat. And I knew that in, in being interested in designing offices, mainly for me, that I had to look at what would create the safest system? So back in 93, I created an office with two, only two zones in terms of the basic zones for the office, an administrative zone for with common air conditioning, you know, typical uh, ducted ventilation. But in the treatment side, I used a four pipe chiller system is what it's referred to. And each one of those rooms is individually heated and air conditioned. And then we took the total exhaust air from the office, that 20 standard 20% recirculation, we pulled it all out of the treatment rooms. So we created a negative airflow 
and then exhausted all that air out of the treatment room. So the, the refresh rate was greater in the treatment rooms. It was compliant with the national standards, created the negatives, and also had individual room isolation so that whatever a patient was breathing in room one, the patient in room two was not breathing that because that air was all getting exhausted when it was done. So we did that back when, and, and interestingly enough, and I didn't know this until a good deal later, the Indian Health Service, which had a large problem with tuberculosis and other illnesses, actually wrote a spec into their design standards for dental offices back in the late 90s and it calls for negative airflows. So you'll see the term negative airflows recur. So if I look, I think I can get a close up and I don't have a, a closer look at that, but there's actually a standard. The DOD, Department of Defense has a, a standard for negative airflows. They're not the same. And one of the reasons is nobody's bothered to go ahead and do definitive research on what that is. So I'm not gonna be able to give you that today, but there are significant push towards isolation and negative airflows. And we know those work, but I have a problem. So again, I did that back in the early 90s. I have a problem with that, which didn't occur to me until now. So we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah. David, based on what I've seen on the floor plans and such, can you talk about room isolation a little bit more? Sure, and the reason room isolation becomes something that we need to talk about now is many doctors are going to look at a strategy for this as can I make a room safe right now? What would it take to make a room safe or two rooms safe? Because they're looking at if you've got an office where you have common air th flow through the rest of the thing, the whole thing's ducted and it's behind drywall you, and you're going to have some nightmare to go ahead and rehabilitate the whole thing and try to split it into zones you may look at a strategy of what could I do to get a couple of these rooms safe now so I can get back in business and feel safe about it. One of the ways to do that is to use the systems that I used back when, but in a much more limited fashion. And there are really two ways to do that. One is to go ahead and use what are packaged air handlers, which is a combination of a heat and cooling unit, an external air conditioning heat exchanger, and at the same time, you'll have a filter built in so you can go ahead and self-contain that room and it's, uh, its heat. So you could cut that room or those two rooms off the common feed and have each of those units have individual controls without doing the whole rest of the office at the moment. That would be a reasonable strategy. Some people are looking at this by using uh, what are called splits, AC splits. Many times when people add on to houses nowadays, they'll get a split, which is a, a condenser outside the house and this wall mounted unit, which will handle all the heating and air conditioning. You can't do it in every climate. There are some places because it, uh, it, it can only run down to a certain temperature on the heating side, you may need accessory coolers, but those are the things our, you know, our engineering staff can talk about that. If people had questions, they can feel free to call. We'll give numbers later. Um, but that's a very simple way to go ahead and cut a couple of rooms off the common. Very, quite reasonable in price. There is a challenge in that those units, the wall mount units, don't have HEPA filtration. So they are causing airflow to circulate in that room that's not filtered or not filtered adequately. You can add electrostatics to those. I prefer the packaged air handler system better. It goes up in the ceiling, for example, or down in the floor because you have a better ability to add filtration to those. Uh, we're working with the largest heating and air conditioning company on earth at, at present to try and actually create systems for doctors to do that. Uh, but some doctors are gonna to wanna to do something sooner, which is why I wanted to go ahead and, and talk about that. David, there is such confusion out there about negative airflow. What's up with the negative airflow? It's totally confusing for people. It's just, you know, this all of a sudden appeared on the scene. We've been spending all our time worried about how to get patients into offices and how to go ahead and meet demand and how to go ahead and do a better composite. And all of a sudden, we're gonna spend all our last couple of months figuring out how to deal with negative airflows. 
And so here's the concept. I'm going to give you the good side of the concept and I'm going to give you my spin on the concept and please don't try to like merge them together because they don't fit. So the first thing is if you have a negative airflow in the treatment facility, this is what you do in a virology lab, you don't want the virus to get out into the rest of the world. So you create a negative flow in the room, a net negative air pressure. You're exhausting more air than you're intaking. So air is flowing in. You're feeding it in from either a fresh air source. You're feeding it in from the hallway since most offices don't have doors on rooms. And if you put doors on those rooms, now we've got an intake pressure problem. So that's a whole other math problem. But assuming that you're going to keep open doorways, You've got to exhaust enough air from those rooms so that the net flow is from the hallway into the room and then exhaust it out. If it's negative airflow, but it's just recirculated into the common airway, we really didn't solve the problem unless we've got quite the filtration in the rest of the office. We'll talk about that a little bit later too. But if you think about this for a minute, what they're saying, and this was the thing in February, which like three o'clock in the morning, we're like, wait a minute. Everybody's focused on negative airflow so that they out there keep the contamination in with us in here in the treatment room. And the result of that is we wind up in a hazmat suit doing treatment. Anybody know what a papper is? Like I hang around with a pathologist, so I know what a papper is. So that's a papper and a papper is basically, you know, you wear this scuba gear in the room while you're treating people. The folks in pathology, for example, when they're, when they're disposing of formalin, they put a papper on to go ahead and do that. They're required to do that. You can wear one of those for about 20 minutes before you feel like you're suffocating in my opinion. And so picture this, this is so, so, Yes, this is possible, though you already saw in the Wuhan surgical study, this is what these guys were wearing and they got infected. I'm not super convinced that every day, every patient, we can go ahead and take these things off and not contaminate us as we're doing it. Never mind, you know, the fact that we're in that environment. And then the part for me is, okay, little Johnny's your new patient. Hi, little Johnny. It's so great to meet you. You're gonna have a wonderful relaxing visit here. You don't have to be scared. That's not going to work as a business model. You know, if that's our, if our business model has to wind up being that, then British teeth are, go are gonna be a big step up from what we look like. Because there's not a whole lot of patients that are gonna be dying to come to the dental office just for, you know, to get a little bit whiter. That's my concern. So it's a concern from a health standpoint, but I've got another concern that, that the model of being able to have care be provided routinely and comfortably to folks, if this is what we have to do, is a problem. That's my problem. All right, so I'm sure that the dentists, viewer, the viewers watching this are saying to themselves, um, how much of these things that you've talked about so far are we gonna end up being forced to do? I'm sure everybody here has read OSHA 3990. I'm sure that it was like one of the greatest things that you like bed. If you want bedtime reading, I would suggest OSHA 3990, but let me go ahead and kind of cliff notes it for you. Engineering controls is recommended at this point, engineering controls specialized negative pressure ventilation in some settings such as for aerosol generating procedures, i.e. everything we do pretty much. So that's my concern. Now, what do I believe? I, OSHA historically, some, some I, I'm going to get more hate mail from this time I spend with you, Tom, than probably anything I've ever done. But there are folks that are going to be like mad at me for saying that OSHA is kind of reasonable. Hey, as long as they send it to you and not to me. Yeah, okay. So that's Dave Ahern, Desergo.com. 
Okay, and I'll try to like reroute it to Chrissy. Yeah, she will get mad at me. But uh, so, but but I mean, please don't hesitate to tell me what you're thinking out there. But OSHA has not been totally crazy on how they've tried to regulate our industry, and. I don't believe that they're going to shut offices down that don't have negative airflow tomorrow. I, I, it can't happen. There, we can't even deal with enough emergencies that they shut down the folks that don't have negative airflows. The number of offices that have negative airflows is so trivial, it borders on none, because nobody's been listening. <laughs> but this could be where we go and I actually think it's a great thing. I really don't want to go ahead and go to the lunchroom in my office and know that the, like they're blowing around viruses and bacteria. They're not doing that in my office. Okay, I'm very comfortable being in the lunchroom, but that's because of the way the AC system's set up to not do that. And so I think really when Dennis think about this, given uh, I'm going to there's only a paper thing here. I don't know if this will come through. I don't know how many of you have seen this, but this is exposure to aerosols by profession. And this document, which Tom, I'll make sure to get to you. Uh, dentists are, you know, dentists and facial cancer surgeons, you know, and very few other people are in the highest exposure rate. And so, it's really, I will feel better when we're not in that category. 170 some, 78,000 dentists. You know, if you have a 1% death rate, you got a pretty good number of dentists that, because the age, you know, age median of dentists, you could have a fair number of dentists dying in this situation. Okay, and, and I don't want to ignore that. I don't want to beg for OSHA to go ahead and solve our problem by having to enact ordinances. But my personal opinion is we ought to get on this to go ahead and avoid that. That's, I guess, the best way I can say it. That makes sense? That, you know, slightly that, that reasonable? Make, that, that makes total sense. We know there's a problem. We shouldn't wait for the government to make us fix it. Yeah, because, you know, it's not their job to do it right. It's their job to go ahead and get a... Um, get a policy in place. I mean, I shouldn't say it's not their job to get it right. It's the, the odds that from the outside, they'll get it really right to the where it needs to be, just aren't that great. And, and I'm, not, so I'm not saying that as a criticism, but just the odds aren't very good of somebody from the outside fixing your problem. So, you know, I, I think that expanding on negative pressures and, and taking that, uh, you know, to the next level, uh, you know, would be a great thing. So here's what I thought about 20 years ago. And again, nobody was interested. Like I spent some extra money to create isolated rooms. I, I justified that in part by saying, well, the nice thing is this room can be cooled independently. This room, if you get somebody, you know, a guy comes in from being a lumberjack in this room and he's got a t-shirt on and he wants the room cold and the person in this room, you know, carries a chill with him. You know, when they come in, they can be in different temperature environments and I'll get my patients are going to be more comfortable. And simultaneously, yes, I'll be healthier and safer. Uh, but that extra money, you know, I don't really know if it was appreciated to, to the level. I've always you know, wondered about that. And certainly most doctors said, I don't have to pay that money. Well, what was dismissed back then was that I thought there was another way to go ahead and take care of this. And... The reality is, and now it's becoming more and more clear, how do people get this illness? I'm going to stay on this specific illness. Though tuberculosis, you could substitute tuberculosis into this, uh, and, and there's many similarities other than size. They get it from droplets and spit, or if they're in a, you know, if they're in the hospital, they're intubating somebody and they get puked on. That's how people get this illness. They're not getting it from surfaces. I mean, it's not, not unless there are droplets that got onto the surfaces. So if you think about that, what we're doing now, we've got some things that are effective, slightly. HIVAC is effective. 
Many of the other isolation devices are not nearly as effective as a simple, great, high-speed evacuation by a qualified dental assistant or a really conscientious and talented two-handed person that can go ahead and, and, and control both whatever they're doing and, and the suction. So that takes a good bit of the problem away. However, again, this is three o'clock in the morning in February. When you're in a dental treatment room and you have your mouth open for treatment and we're spraying water in there and like you're trying to, and you're lying on your back, where are you breathing? You're breathing mostly from your nose. I mean, it's pretty risky to, while there's somebody spraying water in to try and breathe through your mouth, right? It's 70 or 80% of a patient's respiration during treatment is through the nose and that's blowing straight at you. Is that interesting? I mean, we've never been thinking about this. All I can say on that one is, is uh, it's kind of crazy to be blowing that stuff around like that and then try to catch it again. So is there a different way? Is there a different solution? Well, you, I mean, the first thing is you went, wait a minute. So, so if 70, 80% is nasal and the, but that's not, I mean, it's 70 or 80% of respiratory volume, but then you've got a whole bunch of aerosol that we're stirring up orally. So again, no one has the measurements between those two. So I don't think a nasal solution, even though it cuts down 70% of the respired volume from an infected patient. Remember, I'm, I'm not so much worried about them catching this from me. We're wearing gloves. We're doing universal precautions. We're doing everything to protect them against us. I'm worried about us getting it from them because I don't know where they've been. I don't know what they've been doing. I don't know if they've been doing social distancing. And so it's crazy to blow this all around. It's crazy to go ahead and blow this all around the office and then go play catch with it. And everything we've talked about to this point has been focused on, okay, do we catch it in the entire office level through filtration? Can we use UV and high MERV filters? You virtually can't use a HEPA filter on your conventional air conditioning system. Some of the people may be thinking that. The problem is that your AC system doesn't, it's got a squirrel cage type blower. It doesn't have enough force to push air through a HEPA filter. HEPA filter is too dense. Fortunately, high MERV type filtrations, MERV 14, 13, which is not equivalent to a HEPA 14, which is why this is a freaking nightmare to go ahead and like, if you, as a dentist, try to get to know this, uh, it's just good luck. I, I'm sorry, it's just, it's a mess. And there, there are different rating systems for different countries, but to make it as simple as I can, if you blow it out into the whole office and then try to catch it in filtration, you can catch it in two or three or four passes I'm not super thrilled about two or three more passes to catch it. You can isolate it into a room and then you can go ahead and try to at least keep it isolated in the room and then isolate that filtration. But all that is kind of crazy. And so a number of people have been looking at for different reasons at different solutions. And so let's talk about them. First of all, you've seen, everybody has seen vacuums suddenly reappear. Most of them were designed for either air abrasion in the 80s and 90s, or for mercury vapor containment, right? For those dentists that were like making sure to go mercury free. And so they'd use these systems as an adjunct for vapor control. So, so everybody goes to a face shield. Okay, face shields are great. Uh, loops are a problem. So everybody should consider, you've seen vacuums all of a sudden. You've seen vacuums come on the marketplace. They've actually been here for decades. They were primarily used for two things, air abrasion suction and amalgam removal mercury containment. I'm not going to comment on that. They reappeared recently as part of the potential solution for this problem. The problem with vacuums 
is that they don't catch droplets well. To get them close enough to go ahead and catch droplets, you need to have them so close that they're going to compete with the patient's ability to breathe or your ability to go ahead and pass instruments. So there's a challenge with them. I want to be clear though, everybody should try to get their hands on some method of containment now because they work to some level. They vary in their effectiveness. I'm going to get in trouble with recommending this because of the imperfect nature of this. The problem is that they, they don't get placed well. They give a sense that they're working when they're too far out of the field. And so staffs can have a false sense of security with them. I'm bothered by that. But the fact of the matter is, if you could get 60% of the exhaust uh, and, and put it away from you, you're better than where you are now. And th those are attainable or coming attainable uh, in certain supply. Uh, I, the filtration, again, varies tremendously. Uh, CRA is going to be doing a rating of all this, which is a real nightmare for them. And so if any of you are not CRA members, I would strongly suggest that you go ahead. This is the time to know exactly what they're recommending because they're the only people that are doing a comprehensive test of all the infection control units on the market. And CRA has never hesitated to say, here's what works and here's what doesn't work or and why, and, and voice an opinion. And it's why a lot of people get mad at them because they're willing to do that and power to them. So that's that's my opinion on that. So, but we have other things that, so now folks that haven't been using shields, you know, going to shields and what they're immediately uh, discovering is they're waiting forever to get a shield. Then they put the shield on, they realize that, oh, I got loops. And so, uh, I, shields are far from perfect. I am kind of comfortable with staff members at the front desk wearing a shield and feeling pretty good about that. I'm not super comfortable about a shield and a, and a mask being good enough uh, in an operatory unless you've got neck coverage. Uh, and, and you know, once you go ahead and make these things work for loops historically, now we're cutting a hole in them again. What's the odds of that splatter getting through that hole? I mean, you just reduced it down a whole bunch, but you didn't reduce it to zero. And you're still, you know, 10 to, 10 to 15 inches away from the plume of exhaust from that patient. So it's a challenge and we've got to, you know, be realistic about that. There are neck shields, which are, so folks, you know, there's some solutions. There's some pretty good neck shields out there, which actually rest at the neck. And, and rise up, which allow you to accommodate your loops without a perforation. You gotta look at the different ones because they vary in levels of comfort. If you're gonna do that, you might as well not wear a low cut uh, scrub though. So that makes sense there. So, so the question that I'm sure the viewer is, is asking, since it, you've, you've proposed a wide array of things that work pretty well, but nothing that really works. Well, that was the thing that was keeping me up. That's exactly it, is, is how do we go ahead and get something that deals with droplet spatter immediately upon, I mean, it was, uh, the reality is every dentist that practices clinical dentistry, like at the end of an appointment, looks at their loops and their shield and, and anybody that like, anybody that doesn't have any like debris on any of their PPE like you gotta have really long arms and a focal length longer than uh, most of the loop manufacturers, you know, manage to make to, to go ahead and not have that happen. I mean, so we're all pretty confident that there's there's some. So posture helps, so you're not, I, I see a lot of dentists, they're, they're head down in the patient's mouth. Uh, certainly getting away from the patient is, is a whole big benefit, but the real solution had to be a physical barrier between the patient and us. So what is that practical solution? I woke up, I mean, I thought about this a decade ago and I thought nobody will, I don't know how to make it. I don't have the money to spend to go ahead and make something just for me, even though I would want it. And I don't think other doctors are gonna want it. Well, 
I floated this idea out now about six or eight weeks ago, and I was pretty shocked to see from peers that I have huge respect for an overwhelming response of first, well, will it work? And B, oh, that makes sense. And so what we've been working on, you know, during this time that some doctors have had some time for self-reflection and evaluating what the rest of their life is going to be and hoping to get back into practice and maybe this will wash over and maybe getting a little extra time with the family. I didn't have that because we have been here working on this because the first day that we made the first prototype of this, my dental staff said, when do we do we get this for the next emergencies that we do? So what happened here was my staff, who I consider very good evaluators of what works and what doesn't work, immediately said, I need that tomorrow. And then the challenge, and I want to, this is real, uh, the next person coming in said, well, you're going to have that in my room too. So this is a, I mean, a statement and a warning that we found that this works. What we did was we established a laminar flow so that we could, I went 40 years ago, I worked in a cell culture lab under a hood. Now that was a positive pressure hood because it wasn't contaminated stuff, but it's the same principle that you're working behind an isolated zone. And I recall back how well I could, if I got the pressure right, I could maintain the positive pressure, but work without, you know, after a couple of days of being there, I learned how to work without any interference, without any sense that that was unnatural at all. And so that's exactly the experience that we're having. And I'll tell you, the accidental uh, study of this was we took the unit away to go ahead and make improvements. So we've we've been on a five-day iteration cycle since that first version, which means we've got a new testing cycle in five days. Well, we missed the return of the units to the dental practice once. Oh, I'd never want to hear that again. I, I don't want to deal with that wrath again. Because folks that had at first gone, well, this is great, but you know, whatever. And they were pretty crappy first versions. Uh, now, we're, they're not going to have be without a day of having these. So the laminar flow does some important things in the volume of this. The tidal volume of a human exhale is 500 milliliters. The problem with a vacuum is a forced exhale, a sneeze, a sigh, a high velocity exhale overloads the ability of the vacuum to go ahead and catch that volume. You need a volume that can catch surplus tidal volume and hold it there while it's evacuated. If you don't, you've got to have the vacuum up so high again that you can't hear and you can't breathe. So by combining a, a laminar flow, spreading that flow out, but then funneling it in, we're able to hold that volume underneath and then take it away on the cycle of the patient breathing and no spatter gets to the operator or the assistant because we're physically containing it. So that's what we've done and that's what we're working on. And I didn't want to go ahead and tell people about this quite frankly until we were done because I'm obsessive and uh, I won't tell you exactly how but that information got released and so now we're on a commitment to a seven week cycle to be able to produce the commercial units that are demanded and unfortunately I apologize that that demand is already pretty significant so uh, you know folks need to keep that in mind but let me show you a video of how that works I hope this will be helpful So again, tidal volume. The important thing is to go ahead and make sure that you've got a surplus capacity for tidal volume. The other problem that we had with 
uh, with vacuum, pure vacuum only, was that uh, they were subject to buffeting, air conditioners, you know, drafts, open windows. And so we needed a, a way to go ahead and, and buffer from that, capture the tidal volume, and then take that and securely remove it. We do have a portable version that we're making. I'm, it's ultimately, I believe, not the solution for long-term care because I believe that as with any containment of infection, the most effective thing is to have this be ubiquitous. So I believe that the most prevalent solution and most cost effective will be to go ahead and drop this straight from the ceiling or it can run from the floor and evacuate all of this for all of us directly from every room situation. You can greet a patient without it in the way. And then when you drop into treatment, this can be dropped into place uh, and put into use. So we have a track unit now uh, that we're using, and we also are continuing to evolve that portable as well uh, and the filtration there. David, David, where is this exhausted and what's the type of filtration you're using? We go ahead, so so the the portable unit is HEPA filter. I mean, it is HEPA filter, and there's a discussion of, and to clarify for doctors, because I'm sure that guys are like, hung up with where this is. So there's HEPA 13, which is a medical grade. That's 99.95% capture of 0.3 micron. That's actually the hardest particle to capture. It actually has a better capture ratio above that in size and below that in size. That's the, the misunderstanding in all of this. And so there's a NASA study here. If you really have insomnia, oh, you got, here's NASA, NASA's report on, because when they send people to space, they don't get to go get new air. Like they got to kind of bring it up there. And so they got to be pretty good at it. They actually, it's confusing as heck, but uh, so that that's HEPA 13. Uh, and again, I'm Cliff's noting this, so I am oversimplifying. HEPA 14 is often referred to as ultra HEPA. So you've got an additional level. Now that uh, ultra HEPA is 99.997, I believe. It might be 0.9957. You're getting to decimal points where this really doesn't matter, quite frankly. You need to get up to high filtration, but you don't necessarily need to get up to ultra high filtration because what we find in this disease and in many diseases is that this is dose dependent. So if you're walking in a park, you are breathing this virus. You're just safer than being in a restaurant because you're breathing less of the virus. I know people don't want to hear they're breathing any of the virus, but you're breathing the virus, it's there. Uh, so HEPA, this will be HEPA filtered. We may have an ultra HEPA uh, filtration. Uh, I, we have to see whether that matters uh, because there's higher resistance as you go up. So you need more force and more noise and more. And so that's a question. With respect to the ceiling units, once you get this up to the ceiling and outside, and if you do the math, I had to do some math around here. High MERV filtration. We will have a HEPA option for doctors that want to exhaust to HEPA level. Nice to do. Increased motor and noise. Probably not necessary. Strong statement on my part. I reserve the right to be like different opinion on this. But a high MERV filtration, MERV 14, 15 level, will cut down the virus to you know, 99 point some percent and exhaust it out into the open air, that's far better than any masking that's done in social distancing. So those are the couple of different choices. So there'll be options on those things. But again, far more cost effective to go ahead and install these. We know that that's gonna be a challenge to go ahead and make that happen Why we're working with the biggest national heating contractor to go ahead. You, these are not that hard to install. You could go ahead and have your local heating guy do it, but we think that that's the better way to go. Though most doctors at first will be buying a portable and then figuring out what they're doing with the rest of the office is my bet. Ab absolutely fascinating. Um, what do you see for the future? What comes next? Oh, that's see, 
that actually is a really, really interesting uh, situation because what you see in a typical dental treatment room, if you go, to, if you dial back to a dental treatment room, is historically we've added more and more stuff into the operatory, and the more and more stuff is out on a counter, spread all around the room, and so there's a dichotomy here in that where we don't appear to be catching the virus from surfaces but we shouldn't really have things on surfaces quite frankly we should go ahead and have a room that is devoid of stuff inhabiting the room until we need to bring the stuff into use and then any stuff that we bring into use i think i would have been in trouble in dental school for calling all that expensive product stuff right i think somebody would have but all that stuff's got to go away somewhere and needs to be disinfected before it goes away and you really only want to bring out what you need there's no reason to have it all out and all getting contaminated and then you didn't even use a bunch of it so we started two years ago on something we we referred to as consult room of the future we didn't do this for infection control we did this for patient psychological comfort because many patients certainly many of the cohort that we treat half are highly apprehensive they don't want to see anything dental i mean they're like antelope on the serengeti and the minute you like a, there's a clapping noise they're scattering if there's anything sight smell sound all of those things matter to that cohort and so we started this project to try and convert consult rooms from confrontational you know, seats across the table where we talk about money to places where we can embrace the patient in comfort and then convert that space into treatment. And the reason that we wanted to do that was that studies have shown that when you move someone from place to place, you throw off their psyche, you change their focus. So there are people for years saying, hey, consult rooms don't work that well. Well, when you take them out of the treatment room and then you try to put them in a consult room, they're already thinking about, as soon as you get them out of the treatment room, they're thinking about the shopping list, picking the kids up after soccer, whatever else the rest of their life has, and you lose their focus. So we've been trying to do consults in treatment rooms and trying to make the treatment room more hospitable for that, which we've been very successful at. And so then it was, well, why don't we take a consult room and make it so that it can function as a treatment room and then we can have one piece of flow for the highly apprehensive so they never even get near treatment rooms before they start. So David, you and I have never you and I have never had this conversation, but I'll tell you something funny. Your thought process on this from years ago matches what I've told our members for years as well, which is that I've always said that there's this mystical, magical thing that happens electrostatically if you allow the patient's feet to hit the floor, at which point we don't even allow them to swivel and put their feet on the floor during the consult, case presentation, what have you, because the moment that the feet hit the floor, they want to leave. They're gone. They're gone. You're so right. And it just, and I've been saying it too for years and I didn't have proof. Well, there are actually some studies a few years ago that, that showed not in dentistry, just in general, you move, a, you can move them from any place to any place else. As soon as you move them, you lose their focus and you've got to refocus them and restart. And that's crazy behavior. So, so we said, we got to change that. And so we started this study of, can we put everything in a treatment room away? And I think that a version of this is eventually going to evolve into a highly practical solution for the infection control and for the patient's psyche and for the consult all at once. So this is where we're going next as soon as we get the shield to the lot of folks that we have to get them to. So this, you need a chair that can convert from a scary, from a, a administration chair to a useful dental chair can't be scary. We're working with some engineers and a couple of companies to go ahead and change that. So that thing doesn't look like a dental chair. It does there, but it won't. And then enough other room to convert out. So the light actually pulls out of that space, all the treatment 
area pulls out of that space. So actually the, the track light itself and the shield would would be contained in a, in a cabinet and then pull away. So that's what we're working on now. That's a very compact room. It'll be much easier to do in a, in a bigger room. So Tom, that's what we're up to. That's what we're working on the future of how treatment rooms operate and how the flow in an office as a whole operates. We're also working, our design staff has sequestered a good bit of their time for the next while to go ahead and work exclusively on remediation of offices. So we have a program where doctors can work with us and we can quite simply work through, here's how we prioritize this. We have a white paper on aerosols. So if you, this is, okay, this is probably the definitive white paper on aerosols as we know it now. That's available to all your viewers. Uh, we'd just be happy to send that out uh, to them. Uh, we anticipate that the next thing will be, there will be changes in every office, not just the shield at the front desk. There are other things that have to happen in offices now to go ahead and get everybody safe for the long term. We have this anticipation or wish that this is just going to blow over and that a vaccine is going to come and it's going to magically take this away. Well, that's going to happen and make this better. But that's not my metric on this. My metric on this is very simple. When is a helicopter mom going to, with no apprehension at all, say, I'm sending my little daughter Sally in for her cleaning when I know she already has pretty clean teeth because I brush with her every night. And until we're at the point where they, our customers, feel that comfortable in what we've done for them, because they haven't seen reports, you know, on the news that we haven't done enough and that you can communicate to your patients why this is way safer than going to the supermarket, then I think we, we've got a problem. And so we're not going to stop on making these solutions work until everybody's kid can safely go to their local office and get back to normal with a couple of accommodations to make this safer so that this is a good thing for everybody. So that's where we're at. That's why I haven't slept really a lot in the last <laughs> four months. Understandably, and I've always appreciated your, your insights and um, throughout the years, the solutions that you come up with to help us, to help dentists. Um, right now, I think you're doing an amazing job during really challenging times. So thank you so much for taking the time to share this with us. Um, I appreciate you sharing this because again, and I, again, it's about getting us all safe. That's, that's if, if we save lives of dentists and staff members, which we will, uh, then my, my feeling is my whole life's been, been worth it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And again, thank you so much. Take care. If you found this video helpful, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell notification so you won't miss a thing. If you're not yet a GEMS family member, Elizabeth and I would be delighted to help you build your practice and your revenue. We'd love to have you with us here on Planet GEMS for a time-limited offer, a free test drive of GEMS family membership. Go to dentalgoldmine.com. There's a link in the description below. If this was helpful, click like. And thanks for joining Dr. Hearn and me here in the Dental Goldmine. And remember, you're only one gem away.